All right, cool. So everybody, I'm speaking with Angel again. Uh, this is the third time uh, we're on the podcast. So Jazak Lakir for being here. I always hope I pronounced it correctly. Jazak Lakir. Why yeah, bro? Why yeah for having me? Yeah. I always use these now words. You know, I went to a halal shop in a different country and the guy gave me like meat and I was like, Jazak Lakir. And he was like, yeah, nice. I'm like, <laughs> this works. This works. This is not just like on YouTube. It's in real life, uh-huh. you know. Just uh-huh. testing it out. So I was wondering, like, what's um, what's been up with you? Maybe you can tell us, like, a recent update on uh, your life with regards to your dean. I don't know. It's been, uh, I think, three or four months since we last spoke. So did you get married? Do you have, like, three, four wives now? Or what's happening? Oh, uh, no, no, no. I, unfortunately, I'm still not married. Um, I've talked to several several women, but, you know, like... Masha. <laughs> just, uh, it's not it's, it just doesn't work you know and, and through I'm the not, app not, or in real life or no nah, it? it's more so like they reach out to me mm-hmm. and then like some conversation begins to form and um yeah it just it, it never really like I, I just don't feel like there's a connection so i just kind of leave it as it is mm-hmm. but um inshallah we'll see what happens later on you know i'm not pressed bro i'm really not pressed but other than that man i've been reading um i started i3 you know what i3 is no what is it it's uh it's basically like a kind of like an islamic studies type schooling thing it's free alhamdulillah and um man i think i'm like only two or three classes in bro it's it's deep it's deep knowledge like it, it richens the uh your understanding of islam it just makes it way more beautiful and uh just your experiences i'd say it's better it's definitely better it's like an online uh, university or something like that it, it's like that okay. it's free like i said alhamdulillah so if anyone wants to join it they can literally just go to their website i3 institute and then just sign up for it mm. and you can choose what day you want to partake in the classes the classes is like one time per week two hours long and um yeah like i i really don't know much to say on it like as like oh this is what you can expect just know that like your understanding of islam is going to deepen and become more richer and like bro like yeah i think islam is beautiful when i first came in but like now that i have a deeper understanding i'm like damn like yo this is really beautiful (laughs) Yeah, yeah yeah i'm planning to do something similar as well uh just right now i don't have time so i can't imagine studying but inshallah i should do so Uh, yeah bro and the last thing that i want to show is uh this is my third time reading the quran but this time around i picked up the uh the clear quran i have the same one yeah it's it's really good yeah it's really good man i did not expect to learn much else or not not that 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 sounds kind of uh, arrogant but um i didn't think that i was missing out that much until like i saw like clear understand or at least someone who had clear understanding and they're just kind of like giving you context when you're reading you're like ha that's what that meant ah this is what this man over here like something that blew my mind bro is that um you know how it says in the quran that uh that god is basically he's he's the the king of like the east the west the north south everywhere Mm -hmm. So it's like basically anywhere you turn, you are literally facing God. You're facing Allah, right? And then it's like, it made sense to me because I was always thinking, well, okay, I understand that like we face towards the Qibla. You know, we, we have the direction of prayer towards the, the, Ka'aba, the Kaaba, which is the, uh, the house that Abraham built, peace be upon him, right? And it's like, okay, well, why do we face this direction? And the Quran says, like, okay, well, we used to face in the direction of uh jerusalem the um the mosque in jerusalem and then when muhammad came peace be upon him so he basically received revelation like look we're gonna face in this direction and it's like okay now you know who's muslim because everyone everyone who's following the messenger and who's following the main message is facing in this one direction you see that nowadays everyone's facing this one direction but at the end of the day and, you know, Allah knows best, God knows best. I'm not saying this is the truth. 
But like, let's say you didn't know which way was north, which way was east, you know, southwest. If you just started praying, you're still praying in the direction of God. Yeah. You know, and like a part of me was like, uh, like, am I facing the right direction? I don't want to mess this up. But then I realized, like, after reading that, it's like, yo, like, we're always facing the direction of God. Like, yes, we face in this direction because as Muslims, we all do it uniformly. And you know who's Muslim because we're all like, bro, if you were to put a, like a, a lens on the entire world, you would see all the Muslims literally all praying in one direction. No matter where they are, they're all praying in like that same direction. It's like all directed into one specific place. But it's like, even then, like, even if you didn't know that like, you could pray in any direction and you're still praying to the creator, like, you're still in front of the creator, so to say, you know, how that could Of course. Say. Yeah, yeah, of course. We don't worship the, the, uh, the black rock. We just face that pray direction. That direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but by the way, I don't know if you have this one. Uh, it's called Muhammad. Um, his life on early, based on earliest uh, sources and he tells the story of the Kaaba from like how Abraham built it to his sons and everybody. And it gives you like a really good understanding because I had no background into this. I didn't even know like what was the story behind it and like mm. uh, what his sons did and the, the Zamzam, uh, you know, the, the water that, that is there. So it's just a good uh, book as well to, to read. It's very difficult. I mean, it's, I'm reading it, you know, very slowly because there's so many names and it shows you like, um a heritage tree like how muhammad is related to abraham and like everybody is kind of like related into the same um direction so it's really good um yeah uh, so i would recommend it it's just very it's not easy reading it's, it's difficult but it's a good one yeah, about yes. the overall life before what happened uh you know. yeah, send it send it to me <laughs> in a email to this bro yeah yeah it's just there's yeah. so much knowledge you know i really enjoy studying like now Abraham, just looking at his life, he's like the, not the most important prophet, but he is the core. He is everything. Everything comes from him, basically, because he was questioning, like, who is my Lord? Is sun my Lord? Is the moon my Lord? And he was always mm -hmm. like going like that until he mm -hmm. was like, no, no, no. The one who makes the sun go east and west, that's my Lord. And that's how mm -hmm. he got this, you know, spiritual, spiritual awakening. And it's just uh, crazy that everything came from him. So. Uh, and he was like 40 years old he didn't have any son uh, nobody was believing in him everybody thought he's crazy you know it's like even uh, Muhammad peace be upon him he was 40 when he received revelation right so it's like sometimes you have to struggle for a while <laughs> to to yeah. get something in life you know so it's yeah really humbling. I think I think all the the prophets received revelation around like late 30s 40s yeah, well, yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. something about that age. I just had 30th birthday, so I'm going to be... You're getting close, bro. You're getting close. I'm getting, I'm getting there. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I was just wondering about one thing, like, because for me as a new Muslim, like, the one thing that's strange, and now it's not strange after, I think, eight or seven months, but after, like, even five months, it was still strange that whatever I thought was true is now backward. So, like... I thought before embracing Islam, let's say I didn't have any problems with gay people. And I don't have problems with them, to be honest. It's just the act itself now. But uh, let's say I had some sort of moral standard. And now that moral standard switched. So I'm following not what I think is right, but what God told me is correct. Mm -hmm. And so how do you feel about like this? Sometimes you had this idea and now no, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> like you, you, what you thought your whole life about a certain topic? No, it's, it's completely untrue. So do you sometimes feel like, man, like it takes a while to rewire your brain in, in some of these things, right? Yeah, it, it takes a while to rewire. But I mean, if you, if you kind of sit back and just reflect on it for a little bit, you, you kind of understand like, okay, um, whether I would have come to Islam or not, like my morals would have probably changed by the time yeah. that I was like 20 years older, 30 years older, 40 years older. And that's just the state of human beings, but we are ever changing. We are always changing our thoughts, our beliefs, uh, the, our stances on certain things, our morals. And it's like, that's what God came down in the Quran. He's like, look, 
everything that you were feeling, your moral compass, all this stuff, this is subjective. Now I'm going to give you what's objective. I'm going to give you the truth that is never changing. It's always going to be this. It's always going to be constant. And it's like, bro, yes, it might take a little while to adjust to it. But like once you adjust to it, you know that it's not shifting. It's not going to shift. And yeah. I think I think that gives, at least it gives me like a, a sense of uh, assurance. You know, like when you know something is, uh, this is it, and it's not changing. It gives me like a sense of assurance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think this is like very important because like I see it around me at work or somewhere where people are still trying to figure out something and I'm like, it's already been figured out, but you guys are closed towards it. So I'm just going to let you uh, try to find the answers to whatever you think you're feeling, but there's already an answer. But yeah. it's like, somehow, it's sometimes difficult to be in this environment and just uh, see people trying their best or just looking at politics sometimes, you know, um, taking like, uh, like latest case of Afghanistan, what happened there, right? You've probably heard this crazy war and invasion. And so like trying to impose your values of democracy or something or human rights on a country that's already like the basis is based in like unchangeable truth. So it's not going to work. Like those people are already grounded in a completely different set of values. And so it's just understanding that it's so difficult on every level of society. Mm -hmm. uh, that, yeah. Bro, when I was, like, before I became Muslim, I remember I would meditate for, like, hours at a time, and I would have these uh, revelations, these, these, uh, these things that would, these realizations. And anytime I would bring it up to uh, this one friend I had, he was, he was Muslim, and his brother, him and his brother were Muslim they would be like oh bro like subhanallah i didn't know what subhanallah meant like yo what you're saying is like directly aligns with islam and i'm like yeah, yeah, yeah whatever but like yo i realized this isn't that crazy like i only cared about like the fact that i realized that and then bro it's like when i would make videos on youtube people would call and be like yo like what you're saying directly aligns with islam yeah, exactly. and I hadn't I hadn't read anything in Islam, and it's like you're saying it's like everyone's trying to find the answer, and it's like, oh, bro, if you only knew, you don't have to figure it out. It's yeah. already there. And you think you like came to this conclusion, like because you're like one of the few ones, and then you realize, oh, it's been there for a while. It's it's already been yeah. there. I just haven't looked into it because I disregarded a specific culture or religion or whatever. So yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy, um, and so. Yeah. Have you, because the thing is like, people say like, you're a Muslim, Alhamdulillah, but actually you can, the most curious thing is that you will, you can not be Muslim by the end of your life or whenever you're going to die. It's a possibility for a Muslim to be a non-Muslim. And I remember, and when people say like, oh, you can do these minor sins or you can drink and still like um, do Tawbah to Allah and he'll forgive you and all these things. Maybe that's true. But the thing is, like, the more you sin or the more you go away from the straight path, the harder it, it is to go back. And I remember a few weeks ago, I had this, the period of two or three days where I was, like, struggling with something. And I was preferring my desires over what I was supposed to do. And I could feel it so much. Like, it was like I had this terrible fear in my heart that I'm never going to go actually back. I'm never going to feel Iman anymore. And I was just like, man, I'm going to be lost in this dunya. And then I really had to, you know, do the whole shower. Uh, there's a special word for it in Islam. I forgot about it. Gis, gusul, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I and then, something like that. Yeah, and then you do tawbah, you, you beg Allah for forgiveness. Oh. Um, it's like on top of your salats and everything. And I was just like, please, I can't go back. I already been there. <laughs> I can't go back. I need to stay on this path. Uh, and yeah, it, it was like, okay, okay, you can, you can come back, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but so I'm, I'm here, Alhamdulillah, but it's very, it's like a couple of days of something and you're back there where you started and you can't go back that easy. So it's very difficult to stay on the, not difficult to stay on the Dean, but very easy to slip, especially in societies where we live. Um, yeah. you know, 
Yeah, man. There's um, there's this one. I don't know if it's in the Quran itself or if it's just in a hadith or if it's just a quote or something. But it says that. Damn, I completely forgot it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> something about your desires or something like that. Nah, nah. It nah. was exactly. It was related to what we we're talking about. Damn, like my mind just went completely blank, bro. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's fine. but um. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's uh that the one who Allah loves most or something like that is the one who's going to receive the most trials. Yeah. So it's like you receive these trials to test you. And the test is like, are you going to come back to the creator or are you going to get lost? Do you yeah. think you can do it on your own or are you going to come back to the creator? Like who else is going to guide you aside from the creator? You know what I mean? And it's like when we have that low iman, like that's a test, bro. That's a big test. And you're right, bro. Like someone could live their entire life as a Muslim. And for someone watching and they're like, oh, well, how can someone be Muslim and then not be Muslim if they're still practicing and doing this stuff? Well, it's like Muslim means one who submits to God. So you can technically still be practicing and not even be submitting to God. You know, like you, you, you become arrogant, your ego gets very big. And then it's like, yeah, you're practicing. Yeah, you're praying. Yeah, you're doing all this stuff. But it's like, are you really Muslim? Like, are you really submitting to God at that point? And uh, I think that's, that's, not, that's not something that any of us are safe from. Because our ego, bro, you know the ego can come in and just take over at any time. So we always got to be like, asking for forgiveness and everything and for bro for these people that were saying you can drink and then you can make tawbah you can ask for forgiveness like yes yes god forgives but he forgives if the repentance is sincere like if you know listen if you know that alcohol is it's haram it's forbidden allah basically told you it is forbidden and you go and drink it well you're no longer ignorant what you are is arrogant because you knew exactly that you weren't supposed to do this. And then the fact that you knew that this was like a big sin, like it, it was in the book and then you go and do it. Like, yeah, you, if you were really sincere, Allah will forgive you. But then if you thought in your head, like ah, I can drink because I know if I just ask for forgiveness, Allah is going to forgive me. Well, are you serious? Like that, that's already coming from an insincere place. Like have fun with that, bro. Yeah, you can only do this if you don't really understand the concept of Allah and the concept of Jahanna and Jannah. Because like, if we really believe this, if you are a Muslim and you claim to believe this, now listen, what you're giving at stake is your entire afterlife. I just had a nightmare today. And the nightmare was that I was walking down the stairs in a circle and I was expecting that there will be like a door and I can leave, but there were no doors. And I was just walking around in the darkness and I was just screaming, hello, hello, <laughs> nothing. And so imagine this was just a dream and then I woke up. But imagine Jehenna is forever. So imagine being in this, I'm not trying to scare anyone, but this is the promise of Allah. This is the promise that there is a place designed by Allah. Imagine designed by Allah, not by you or a human, by Allah to, to, <laughs> to do this forever. So if you're, you have this on one hand of scale and then you, you want to drink like, if you really understood, if you truly believe that this is truth, then you wouldn't even do it. If it was in dunya, like you wouldn't even, if somebody threatened you, I'm going to lock you up here, you wouldn't do it. But if Allah tells you, you're like, ah, oh, it's fine. Because you don't really, you, you don't have that iman yet. But we need to really be careful with this and just remember in Quran, in every page, it says like, hey, I warn you, I, like, be careful. Like, this is really going to happen. There's going to be a judgment day. It's going to be 50,000 years. And you're gonna be sweating and you're gonna see everything you did. And so, like, are you ready for this? Or because you're gonna see this action as well. And it's like sometimes we have these like very positive reminders and stuff like that, but you have to also look at the other side, like, hey, there's you know, it's it's very real, and there's gonna be it's gonna be, you know, people will be intoxicated, but they won't be, it's gonna be the severity of the day that will hit them. So it's it, you know just always reminding that like whenever i'm on a street and i just see something i'm always like 
uh, whatever, doing something to remind myself, Allah exists, Allah exists. Just like forget about this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Having you that know, dark because world. it's like crazy. Yeah, having that God consciousness. And it's crazy that, like, even in the Quran, like, bro, it, it's, it gives you specific details over, like, what's in Jannah, heaven, and what's in Jahannam, hell. And it's like, oh, wow, like, if that's not enough for you, understand that it's not giving you all the details. It's only giving you a select amount of details so you have an understanding. Okay, this is this is for the most part what it is. But like, bro, you it's even said like, yo, in Jannah, in heaven, you will be given something that resembles fruit. Like you, you'll be given a fruit like that resembles a date, but the date isn't a date. It's going to taste like something you've never tasted before in your life. You know, so it's like, and then it says that we're going to have uh, partners up there, like mm -hmm. in, in relationships, you know, like spouses and stuff like that. A woman's going to have a man, a man's going to have a woman. Bro, like we're going to have partners and these partners are going to be incomparable to what we have here in the dunya. So it's like, just let your mind try to grasp onto like you. It gives you just a brief little bit to where you can comprehend, but not to where you understand everything 100%. We will never understand everything 100%. The only one that does is obviously the creator. But it's like, just to think, man, like you had that nightmare and you were in the dark, basically trying to like knock on doors, screaming like, help, like, is anyone there? Bro, like, who knows, man? That could be part of Jahannam as well. Like I had a nightmare one time where I was, uh, I was like going up these stairs, but I was like stuck in this, like, I don't even know how to describe it, but it was like some kind of like puzzle and like, I was trying to unlock this puzzle, but the puzzle kept changing. Mm -hmm. So every time I would get further in, it would just change. And then I would go right back and like get further and further away from like solving the puzzle. And the only way I could get out was if I solved the puzzle. And bro, like, I, it doesn't seem like much, but in the dream, I was terrified, bro. I was terrified that I couldn't figure this out and I was gonna be stuck there trying to figure out this puzzle being tortured for the rest of my life, bro. It was Crazy. weird. Like I'm, I'm saying it right now, and it's like, bro, that like, come on, that's 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 not a big deal. But bro, like in the dream, that was no. Serious. But in dreams, yeah, I, those feelings are amplified, and even a ridiculous thing in a dream, it's like a completely different uh, feeling, you know. And uh, yeah, you know, it tries to show you something, yeah. And if you think about like it says uh, that make the the example of Muhammad and his family the bare minimum to enter Jannah. That's the bare minimum. Uh, so you have to really be like, okay, I'm doing bare minimum. I'm praying five times a day. I'm fasting. I'm doing eating halal, but this is nothing. I can do much more. I'm still obsessed with money. I still want my house or something. I should like the level of these prophets at the end of their life. They gave out everything. Everything went no, no. Uh, I mean, the prophet died in debt, basically, just like everything was in charity. <laughs> so it's like, why? Because he knew, like, he doesn't want to stand in front of Allah with some sort of anything from this dunya. Because, but that's the level that we can't even get to, that level of Imam. But, uh, you know, we should be looking at that like, okay, I'm still, I'm still part of this yeah. world. Yeah, we should strive for it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Do you have anything that happened to you, some crazy thing uh, since you embraced Islam, uh, where you kind of like, you you had an experience where you definitely felt Allah or one of your duas answered or something like that that was like a clear whatever sign or something yeah I, I've had many but I won't speak on behalf of like the details or like what happened just because uh something that I realized during Ramadan is like if you share your blessings like if you if you tell other people about your blessings and it's like you kind of stop receiving those blessings and like those things occurring but if you stay quiet and you stay humble and grateful then it's like you keep receiving so i'm not saying this is like boasting but i'm saying it as like listen it, allah hears everything if, if you pray to allah and you are sincere in your prayer then it will be answered so like you will experience things if you weren't sincere in your action in your heart like deep down you were sincere 
you you experienced some for sure for sure so you, you had some some experience for sure right yeah yeah that, bro. definitely yeah i mean uh what uh you know the thing have you had a chance to visit um i don't know a, a muslim country since we last spoke or did you, are you did you stay in the u.s i want to i haven't yet yeah having yet I, the whole covid thing man like i don't i don't really know how the uh the restrictions are on the borders mm. yeah and i'm really i'm not trying to get the vaccine have you gotten the vaccine well i got the two shot vaccine i went to istanbul you know so uh yeah. it's i mean everybody almost here is vaccinated and it's not that far for you it's very far away i mean it's like oh you have to do like a big flight for me, it was like two hours directly from my city. So it's very close. Uh, but yeah, it's like uh, for you, man, you can't even imagine. It would be like a, uh, boosting your iman through the roof to just visit Istanbul or some place like that. Because like you just get there and the first thing you see, like when the lights go down and it's like, let's say at nighttime, you see a big, big Laila Hailala on top of air, like a big mosque. And nobody's like afraid to say it. everybody's like 50% of women wear hijab, 50% maybe not. But like you can clearly see like, uh, you know, the Adans are everywhere all around the city, 4,000 mosques in every corner. Uh, you can do your voodoo outside everywhere. Everywhere is voodoo, basically. Awesome. Everything is everything is halal. Everything is, you can live both lives. You can be a secular person in Turkey and you can also be like a religious. You can choose whatever you want to live. And I think it's, I mean, it's not a hundred percent Islamic country. Of course, there are, there are issues and stuff, but it gives you that like ability to really feel Islam, which you will never do in the U.S. or where I am, because it's like a minority. But yeah, it's it was just a complete game changer of getting like closer to Allah and stuff, and doing these nightly prayers with the people in these huge mosques. It's like, man, I I pray here with like in some like basement, you know, with some guys, but. There, it's completely different. That sounds beautiful, bro. It is. I mean, I really like. If it was closer, it's just like one weekend. It would like be very, very helpful, especially for a revert. So you know, you're not crazy. Or you know, like these people actually exist. This is a whole civilization, and this is how they live. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, do you plan on moving to one of the Muslim countries? No, I was actually mm, trying to figure that out for a while. I spoke to a lot of people. Um, and most people told me uh, after a few days, a few things bothered me in Turkey as well, because it's not my culture and not my language. Um, and so, yeah, maybe you can feel that level of Islam. But after a few days, I really got used to it. And I wasn't even bothered by the Adan and stuff. But I was just like, huh. And so basically, I think you have to make a decision whether if you stay in your country, which I plan, plan to do, um, you know, I have like a goal that I want to achieve and a vision. And right now we're organizing a few things, a few debates and like a, having a, a basic goal of what, what do I want in this country? Because it's not an Islamic country, but maybe having a better community is better than being in a Muslim country, but not knowing anyone and just kind of like have it for your own benefit, but you're not benefiting anyone. Like your conversion could change so many people's lives back in your country or in the States, rather than if you move out, yes, you can maybe live a better life as a Muslim there, but you won't have like this purpose, this mission. Because right now I, I feel like I'm in Mecca, like when, you know, like uh, this is surrounded by non-Muslims and I just feel like this is the, the phase. Um, but if you move there, it's like you're in Medina, everything's set up, you don't have to do nothing. And that's when people get complacent, they forget about Islam. There's no dawah, there's nothing, everybody's Muslim. So what do you do? <laughs> You know, it's just like, you will enjoy it. So I plan to go on a lot of vacations and stuff with my family, of course, to make them see the culture and everything. But I think it's like here, it, it's much more on your purpose. You feel it every day, like uh, a purpose to get out, you know, to, to be an example, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Everybody has a different idea. Yeah. Yeah. What do you want to do? Have you thought about this? I don't know yet, man. Um, I don't know yet. Uh, I gotta praise Sahara because I have I have two destinations in terms of like 
where I'm thinking of going right now to spend mm. uh, the next several years cultivating some skills. And I don't know if uh, if that's going to be in Canada or if that's going to be in Thailand. So what are the so skills? I, are the skills are not Islamic? Martial arts. Something... Martial arts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Arts. I'm I'm developing the Islamic studies and all that. The skills are Islamic like skills. More just studies. I'm, de- mm-hmm. I'm developing all that like as I do everything else. So I I know that I'm doing this. There has to be a reason why I'm doing all this. You know. So like I'm just I'm following what the Creator is putting in front of me, and I'm trying to be like as sincere in my uh asking of guidance because like bro if i try to do it on my own if i say look i'm gonna do this i end up just kind of uh effing it up you know what i mean yeah what's your goal with uh, mma right you train or so it first started like are you you want the like the sugar-coated version or or the long version i mean you can give me both (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah, so I do MMA now. I feel like I do it because self-defense is like just something that's so vital that I think like everyone needs. You know, it's, it's better to have that skill and not need it than need it and not have it. And there's this specific quote that was like, I'd rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener at war. True. Sure. You know? <laughs> You know, it's like you just you want to have it just in case. And like with the way the world is going nowadays, like we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen, bro. So, again, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And like my 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 take is not just martial arts, but it's self-defense in general. So like guns, knives, anything that's available to you, having peak physical, mental conditioning, being able to handle high stress, high pressure uh, situations. Because, bro, like, you could train martial arts for the rest your entire life. But then when you're put in, like, a real fight, it, it all goes out the window because you you never actually can handle. You know, you were never actually in those high pressure, high risk situations where it's like mm. you never learn how to control the adrenaline rush through your breathing and all that stuff. You know, so, like, it, it's all connected for me, and that's the short answer, bro. So I don't know if you want the long answer. But you started out with some specific martial art, like box. Did you start out with boxing or some something else? Or how did you develop yeah. to MMA? All right, so I guess the long answer is coming in. <laughs> uh, so I, when I was a kid, man, I was, I was abused. I told you this already. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't know. Um, but I was abused for like eight, nine years. And because of this, uh, I, I was very kind of like closed off. And I had this like fear of uh, confrontation, of getting the fights and all that stuff when I was older. Now, sometimes I would, but it, it was still there. Like that fear and just like not wanting to be in confrontation, it was very, very present. And then it's like when I first started doing martial arts like legitimately my friend was like oh let me show you what Muay Thai is and I was like all right bro so we were in his garage and then he was just showing me a few combinations how to throw the the Muay Thai roundhouse kick which is different than like in Taekwondo and karate is and man like let me tell you something it hurts when you get hit with a a Muay Thai roundhouse kick It, it hurts bro it really hurts like if you get hit by someone who knows what they're doing, they can shut your leg down. Mm. They can hit your leg in a, in a point where literally all the blood rushes in to like certain areas where it locks your leg up and you can't use your leg anymore. Nice. It's, it's pretty crazy, but it's pretty crazy. It's beautiful at the same time, but crazy nonetheless. So my friend was showing me this. And then I remember when I was doing it, it gave me like this sense of freedom. And like, I wasn't Muslim at the time. I was, kind of spiritual kind of going through like that whole uh it wasn't a divorce but like me and my fiance had split so like I was in a very low place in my life I was still trying to like deal with all this trauma all these demons that I had and then when my friend showed me this I felt this like this freedom you know and there was no drug involved there was no extra stuff it was just me 
hitting this bag, me doing combinations with like these pads and then me sparring my friend. So I was like, damn, like there's something here, you know? And then that led me to like getting deeper into martial arts. And then a part of me at one point was like, yo, I want to go pro with this. I want to like do all this stuff and be like Habib Nurmagomedov, be like uh, Conor McGregor. But nah, bro, like that was just my ego talking. And like once I took my ego out of the equation, then I really like, you know, what's my intention here? And I'm still kind of trying to figure it out. But like, I know that it hasn't been put in my life for no reason. You know what I mean? And like, there's a very strong pull in the direction of martial arts. And I know that I know that it's not a bad pull as long as I keep my ego out of the equation. But the moment my ego steps in, that's it, bro. Like, it, it, it's no longer good because then it's like, I'm mm. not doing it for the sake of Allah anymore. I'm doing it for the sake of myself. Yeah, that's, that's difficult to, to keep in check. But uh, it's a beautiful lifestyle, to be honest. Um, like, I've been boxing for two years only, so I'm no, no, no where, where you are. But I remember when I started... I know, you, probably got, you probably got the hands, you probably got the speed and the combos. Come on, you know, don't put the, yourself the, down. The thing is, like, when I started out, I was really bad. And then after nine months, I went to spar with my friend. And he was like, like, like it was like his third lesson or something. He was really beginning. And I, he looked to me like a professional, like he, he thought I was a professional. I'm like, I just like, started out like almost a year ago. Like I know nothing just to hit a bag, a few things, but I don't know. And he was like, no, you're like hitting a bag really good. I'm like, really? So I, I didn't really see any progress during those months. I just thought I, I thought I'm on the same level as I started, but of course it, it progresses. But I, uh, to be honest, it's not like my talent uh, maybe you have a much better physique or something uh, so it's not like something i would pursue but i really enjoy it especially when you get into like uh, if you're like at the end of the training it's really good or just uh, mm. messing around with people and uh, yeah and just taking it out and especially you get into this zone of like uh, i like it very much uh, boxing only i i saw some guys training muay thai and uh, stuff but it's, it's not something it's I, I was yeah. pulled towards yeah you should try it out though you should try it out it's it's a lot of fun once you get into it and and bro let me explain a yeah. few things all right so number one um physique kind of doesn't matter as long as your skill is there and then if you have the but conditioning I'm old. I'm old i'm 30 you know i bro i'm an old guy you you know the prime the prime age like the prime age of like a professional fighter is 34 years old yeah but it depends i think tyson said like he peaked at 19 somebody peaks at like 28 so they have different like periods when you peak at your in performance terms, yeah. in terms of peak eh, i don't know you maybe you know better so educate me yeah so i got you bro so um again physique is just one factor like someone could look like ass but their conditioning is out of this world. Look at Nate Diaz. You know Nate Diaz? Yeah, or Andy Ruiz, right? Yeah, but Nate Diaz, bro, his cardio is through the roof. He can go forever, bro, and he doesn't get tired. Mm -hmm. It's because it's conditioning, bro, and partly genetics, but conditioning. And he's got the skill as well. So in martial arts, it's all about the skill and understand that anyone can learn martial arts. Like all those high level moves, all like the, the movements and everything, everyone can learn that. That's not something that's like, oh, you need to be skilled. You need to have talent, bro. The only thing that I would consider talent is your ability to control the adrenaline that's being pumped into your system when the moment hits, when you're either I've never sparring. had that experience, except the sparring, but I like a real fight never had it. So I, I would be it's, inclined to have it, but I would get Yeah, don't don't up. look for it. If it happens, it happens, but don't look for it, you know? It's like a but, professional um, boxing or amateur boxing fight. You 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 don't even have to do amateur. You can either one talk to uh someone in the gym who also wants to test mm. their their ability and their skill. Yeah, and you guys can go hard as if it was like a professional fight, but you have a a ref and you have like more people. It's more friendly environment. You know what I mean? Yeah, but or I just see can... their level is much better. Like they're like uh, yeah, the the guys in the gym. They are some guys who are like really hard. So I I'm kind of afraid. Yeah, but to... bro, they they only got there because over and over and over yeah. repetition, 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 repetition. See what happens yeah. is 
our body, the way it develops this skill, because it's all physical, is that it, you, every time that you move your body, like let's say I'm right here, I'm at the bag, and I'm going for a body shot, right? Just a body shot to the back. This movement, my brain is sending all these impulses into these neurons and all these neurons are firing, right? And there's like this pathway with, um, I believe it's called uh, the myelin sheath surrounding like a, an axon or something like that. I'm definitely butchering this. But what ends up happening is every time you perform a movement, uh, the sheath basically gets thicker to where less of the energy is lost while it's transferring through this line. So imagine you have this like this tube right here, and then you're you're throwing all this water to get to this endpoint. The endpoint is you throwing the body shot, right? In the beginning, you have several pit stops, which are like they have all these holes open. So as you're throwing the water, a lot of the water is going to be lost before it gets here. So your your uh, coordination and your ability to throw this hit is not really going to be that good. But the more you do it, the more you keep sending water, your body's going to be like, ah, we need to adapt. We're losing too much water in this process. And because of that, we're also losing more energy. So you throwing that body shot is taking a lot more energy from you because you don't know how to do it 100% effectively and you're thinking too much. So not only are you using too much energy in your body, but using too much energy up here in your head. Because you're trying to think like, oh, how do I throw this? Am I throwing this right? Am I pivoting? Am I like twisting my hips enough? You know what I mean? But like the more you do it, your body adapts to where now in these pit stops, you no longer have these holes. So now it's like it gets, the, the holes get covered and then the holes get covered by thicker material, and thicker material, and thicker material. And the more you do it, the energy transfer, like the amount of water that's going through is transferring more efficiently, more efficiently, more efficiently till it gets to the point where it transfers so efficiently that it, it's it's second hand now you don't even think about it like you're, you're performing this body shot so perfectly just flawless technique where someone looks at you like yo you, you got like professional level striking but in your head if you think about it you're like i mean i only started a few months ago yeah i i, I don't know how i could have that so it's like you're the one that's putting yourself down because like bro i've had people come up to me and be like bro you got professional level striking i'm like Bro, thanks, but I mean, I've only started like a few months ago. And again, it's just repetition, bro. You do repetition and your body will literally perfect itself before your mind will rationalize that your body has perfected it. And it's the same, like, not just with sports, but with everything. Like when I was learning how to pray, first you think about it because you need to think about what you're saying and you don't know the words. And you need to say it in Arabic. So I have it printed out. I'm learning it. I can't focus on Allah. I'm missing it all. And then after a few weeks, I get it. I learn it. I memorize it. And now I can get deeper. And now it's like normal. It's like normal for me now. But like just six months ago, at no point, I would tell you like, oh, I can learn Al-Fatiha and I know how to pray, all that stuff. Like it was too difficult for me, but just there are people who just look at that like, oh, it's too, too, too difficult. I have to think too much through this. Uh, same with boxing or whatever you're doing physically as well. It always, there's this big like barrier in the beginning when you're learning something new. It's like so, you know, uncomfortable. Uh, but it takes a few weeks to go through that. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's beautiful, man. Like it, it's, we want ease. We want comfort. But it's like, dude, what we really want is discomfort. What we really want is for it to be difficult because the more difficult it is, the more challenging it is, the faster we're going to adapt, the faster we're going to grow. Like, bro, if, mm. if I were to throw you right now, if I were to throw you into a martial arts, an MMA gym, mixed martial arts, and they're over here going, ham, bro, like I'm talking about these are professionals. You will be intimidated. Anyone in their right state of mind will be intimidated going into this gym don't care who they are. But the thing is, is like, you're going to get your ass handed to you so much that in a matter of one year, bro, you will progress in the amount of time that it might take you 10 to 15 years in a gym where it's not really, it's not really that intimidating. The people aren't that good. You know, they're, they're all right, but like, it's not challenging you. When, when there's like a very high need for you to 
you know, step your, I was about to say another word there, but you got to step everything up. Your body adapts really quickly, bro. Mm. So Alhamdulillah, man. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'll try it out maybe. <laughs> but now with COVID, a lot of gyms are closed. Some are open, but, you know, it's yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah. Do you work yeah. out in a gym or do you just work at out? At the moment, home? at the moment, I'm in, I'm in North Carolina. So and where I'm staying at with my dad, he has a neighborhood gym. So I just go there. Um, I've been recovering from a groin injury, but mm. alhamdulillah, like it's getting better and better as I progress. Um, but before that, before I was injured, I was definitely, you know, going to a gym with like a whole bunch of people, you know, like, and we're doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, where like you're like right there in front of someone's face, just breathing on them with no mask on. So, mm. like, if you're going to be doing that, like, you, you can't be afraid of getting sick or anything. Yeah. I've heard uh, who's the boxer in the US, like the one who can knock out somebody with one punch right now. He's uh, one of the heavyweights. Uh, Deontay, Deontay Wilder. Wilder. Yeah. He yeah. said, like, boxing is the best lifestyle. Like, you just, uh, or whatever martial art, basically, you just kind of uh, wake up and you have to stay healthy. You have to, like, be ready. And then you have a lot of people around you always. And then you kind of uh, train multiple times a day. Plus you like uh, do something, then you eat. And it's like uh, very good also for a lot of fighters are like religious. Like you can see it because it likes, it, it goes well with that lifestyle, you know? So I think it's, it it's really good. It's definitely it not is. what people portray. Like it's only for like dumb people or something. Definitely not like the best fighters are like one of the smartest ones. Uh, maybe not Nate Diaz, but like except him. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, definitely, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, difficult difficult sport and i was talking to my friend and he was uh talking to his sheikh and his sheikh was like you know almost every single sheikh that you talk to they say that um striking to the face is haram mm -hmm. like even if it's training purposes striking to the face is haram forbidden and like my friend sheikh said like yo I, i'm like the only sheikh who says that striking to the face is it's not haram, it's fald. It's obligatory in training. Like, tr mm. MMA is obligatory. Like, we should all know how to defend ourselves, bro. And it's like, man, like, that's what we need, bro. We need people who are just, like, real. They're, like, they're, they understand the reality of, like, how everything is developing nowadays. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and the one thing I, like... When sometimes I look at some YouTube channels of uh, some sheikhs or muftis or whoever, like 99%, 0.9% of their content is about a, a ruling. Mm -hmm. Like there's a rule for this or like this is the rule when you do this or, and I'm like, but like, what is this? This is not, I mean, I'm not saying they are wrong. I'm just saying, why is their focus so much on this when 90% of Islam is Tawheed? Is the the remembrance of like when uh, I I'm a bit disappointed sometimes from uh, some people that they don't really stress. There's few people I really follow who who really give me the core kind of guidance, but like really stressing Tawhid and stressing these core fundamental beliefs and remembering Allah and all these things. This is the 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 message. And then of course learning about different things like Islamic banking or whatever you you want to learn. You have a lot of shows on your podcast as well. But I think there's like too much focus on rules. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just like, it should be proportionate. Like how much are rules part of the Quran? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, me, I don't know how many percentage wise, but what about the stories of prophets? These are chapters in the Quran. Or what about the other things? And um, I think this is, this is the, the, this should be the focus because there's the wisdom in those things. In rules, you, you have some wisdom, but it's, it's, you know, I don't know. It's just my feeling that we there should be more focus on it because this is what makes people interested in Islam. Definitely not rules. Uh, this is what people are turned off by. You know what I think it is, bro? Tell me. And first off, let me preface this or preface this by saying that uh, this is just how I think. If I'm wrong, definitely, hey, I'll take full responsibility. 
But I think that it's gotten this way because of two reasons. Uh, number one, not many people are actually actively seeking knowledge and furthering their understanding and their development in their deen and as individuals. Let's just be honest. And then number two, a big majority of, I'm going to say the population, not just Muslim population, but our human population in general, they're just sheep. They're mm. just consumers. So it's like, that's where I feel like all of this stuff comes from, you know, and, and I may be wrong. Allah Allahu God knows best. God knows best. But this is from my observation. That's what I think it is, bro. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think there's too much emphasis put on the external. Let's say, how long is your beard? How many years have you been a Muslim? Like, and then like, to me, maybe I'm wrong as well. To me, Islam is 80% how you behave, like how the behavior. That's if Quran, if you memorize the Quran, let's say you memorized it, but you haven't put it into practice, what good is it? Even Allah says in the Quran, it's like a donkey with like uh, books on his, uh, he's carrying books, but no, there's no use for you. You have to put it in practice. So like, um, I think there's too much focus. And I've heard many uh, Muslims say this, like they went to like Islamic schools and they memorized the Quran, but they didn't know why they didn't ponder over the verses. So then of course, I mean, you will have this disconnect. And I think we just have to kind of go back to what was the message? What's the message? <laughs> you know, and uh, connect with that message. And then these things help. I definitely want to learn the Quran at some point or, you know, do all these acts of worship, but they are not the foundation. You know, it's just because you have a big beard and you wear nice clothes, you, it doesn't mean you're a good Muslim. Like you have to realize this. Somebody looking like uh, me or not me, but like somebody who's like a white guy with no beard can be a better Muslim than somebody who's been a Muslim for their whole life. So I just have to look at it like that, you know. There um, might, bro, there might even be someone who's not even Muslim. They haven't even yeah. taken the Shahada, but they're a better Muslim than you. If we were to, like, just break it down, that's like, okay, what does a Muslim entail? You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Based on the behavior or something like that, for sure. Uh, it's, it's, you know, this is, this is definitely complicated. Um, I was wondering about one thing, maybe, because, um, you know, you touched on, uh, upon last time. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> Appreciate it, bro. You've mentioned uh, that you had experience with different sort of um, psychedelics or different, um, let's say, drugs, should I say? I don't know. Um, but why do you think, because I think this has to do a lot with depression or like mental health. Why do you think you were partaking in those things? Um, not to say you were uh, promoting it or anything or exposing, but just like thinking about why in your case, as a case study, why do you think you were doing it? Uh, you know, was there, was there like a specific reason or not really? Was it yeah, just going yeah. with the flow? It, it was more so it started off because I just wanted to get high. I just, I wanted to. But why? Feel, you wanted to. Because, because I wanted to feel something more because I was so numb. I mm -hmm. had so much trauma built up in my life from my childhood that like I was so closed off that the only time that I experienced something was um, when I did something that was just ridiculously dangerous and stupid or if I took drugs. And mm -hmm. for me to be safer instead of going out here and like just doing the most stupidest things that you could think of just to get that rush to feel something. It was, it was a little safer for me to, you know, take that. And I'm not saying, okay, I should have, I'm just saying that it was the lesser evil at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I took it just so I could feel more. And then it got to a point where like, I started to have some like spiritual awakening when I was, you know, doing them. So then now, like, I was taking them so that I could go deeper into the spiritual journey and have more answers. But it's like anything that you get on psychedelics, even the people in the um, the uh, psychedelic forums, like on Reddit and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and YouTube, bro, 
they say is like it's it's called unearned wisdom you know you, you do a trip and it's as if you pick up the telephone and god tells you uh, you know you get an answer you receive an answer and then you're supposed to hang up the telephone that's that's what happens in in your normal day-to-day -day life you're praying you're reflecting you're meditating you, you know you're going about your life and god you god you receive something god gives you something but it's something tangible something you can internalize where it's basically you like you picked up the phone for like a brief second and then you just snapped it down because like you got you got something you had to put it down because like hold up this is this is so much that just a split second was more than I could handle and I need to internalize this and it'll take you a while before you pick that phone up again when you take a psychedelic you're basically picking up this phone and you can't put it down so now you're receiving so much that it's like bro once you come out of the trip you 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 can't internalize it you can't process it so it's like what was the point of having that trip all the stuff that you realize it, it's going nowhere it's not benefiting you in any way shape or form so then it just you get into this place where you're just kind of spinning your wheels out do you still remember some of those trips or oh, yeah. are they like a distant I, rem i remember i remember almost all of them bro I remember really almost all of them hmm. Hmm. that's crazy yeah are those good memories because i know it can be good or bad some of them some yeah. of them were good some of them were very bad bro yeah yeah, yeah. it was one time well actually i won't i won't expose it i won't expose it just yeah <laughs> yeah i don't think you can get these things i didn't do psychedelics never in my life but i did the the normal stuff that you do you know mm -hmm. the green stuff and I, there could be some insight there uh, but i uh, i never had this sort of like picking up the phone going you know it, talking it about weed right yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean yeah, that's, you know that's like a very low scale there are some strains like that uh, could get you somewhere but oh yeah it's yeah, yeah. and it's not fun there are some which are not not fun at all for just <sighs> like you have ton of flashbacks even afterwards but um Yeah, I, I like right now. I don't remember any of my like these sort of like weird thought patterns I had. I never, I don't recall them at, anymore. I just knew like there was something, but I don't really remember it. So I guess psychedelics give you like that visual component, and you like memorize it, and you don't forget it. I mean, I I remember the 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 things on weed as well. Yeah. Some yeah i just did it so much that i don't remember i was like yeah. every day twice so after some time it just blends in you just don't even live in reality you know yeah but alhamdulillah bro we're not doing that anymore yeah yeah definitely i don't know what was the reason why i even did that but like yeah, i don't but know I mean, most things I've... i ever did i don't know the reason why <laughs> yeah yeah i feel that but I mean, is what it is. It's, it's Jaiilia, bro. It's yeah. Jaiilia. Yeah, not good. But um, my maybe one one last topic I wanted to ask you: Have you ever? I'm sure you you've had some depressed thoughts and stuff like that. But have you ever had like a really really deep depression from like an existential point of view? Not just you know because some things happened to me as well in my childhood and it. I got over it slightly differently, but like when, when you were like older, have you ever had like a really like few weeks or months of some certain state that you just couldn't get out of? Because I remember I had this like 10 month period and maybe I'll tell you how I got over it. But like, have you ever experienced this stuff? Like this crazy depression out of nowhere. There was no impulse. There's nothing just from one day to another and just stayed for you for, for a few you know days or weeks i had i had it like that for maybe like a few days at a time but the only time that i had like depression big big time was um during like breakups like when i broke up with my first girlfriend mm -hmm. for the first time and then when my fiance had uh cut things off with me that's the only time that i felt like depressed for months but like, f like for no reason I'd say only like a few days at a time. Yeah. Man, Alhamdulillah. That's so good. So what'd you do? What'd you do? 
nothing nothing basically i think this is like the most the most important experience in my life because i didn't have anything i was just one day walking from work and i felt this pain in my head and i was like okay and then the next day i woke up and the pain is still there and it's like a slight pain like just like like let's imagine an ant walking around your brain and he's not stopping he's, you always feel him like somewhere there <laughs> and it just intensifies every day and you know so i was like uh, after three days like why is it not leaving sometimes you feel these things like sometimes you get a day where you have like this itch or something hurts but it goes away and it didn't go away and then you know i i remember doing some things like we said weed or something just trying to figure out if this helps or should i get drunk or what should i do to, to make this uh, go away it wasn't painful it was just like annoying and then over time it created this spiral of bad thoughts and it was really like uh, not just depressing i basically after a few days it was like second or third week i couldn't really eat or i couldn't if i would hear a music it would just be so loud i couldn't even be inside a bar or inside a restaurant i would have to leave and my color changed into like pure white like like chalk white like a ghost um so i was like is this like what is this tumor like am i dying and like really serious stuff and i couldn't stop thinking about it and i was all the time i was just thinking about this but like non-stop always and i had my girlfriend at that time with me my now wife alhamdulillah and uh, she was like always helping me but nobody knew what's wrong with me so i was googling around is there a disease that starts out of nowhere uh no and then i fainted at the workplace then my colleague brought me to the hospital they did the ct scan of my brain they put like yodium in it and to light it up and nothing you're all completely okay and i was already ready like i'm gonna die so like this is like tumor for sure so at least i had a good life or something <laughs> And so I was like getting ready to die. Like I was making peace with it as a non-Muslim, you know, and then nothing. I'm like, how can I be all right? This doesn't make sense. This went on for 10 months. Every day that I woke up, I felt like dying. Basically, it was really unpleasant. It couldn't even work. And then, yeah, I had to fly to Brazil at the time. It's crazy stuff. And then I remember uh, basically just thinking about it. Nobody could help me. No doctor. They just said, this is a disease of young people. It occurs at the age of 25, usually, when they are like young professionals and they enter workforce and they realize like, I don't know, it's like a psychological disease and it doesn't go away. And it's just, it's called, it, it, it had a special name, but like you should take magnesium or take some basic vitamins, but there's no, it actually doesn't manifest. It's just in your head. I'm like, well, this, this is the worst thing ever. <laughs> um, and then. I remember like, okay, so if this is psychological, I have to really come, I have to really analyze myself, like what's wrong with me. And so I remember for 10 years, I had like a health issue besides this one that I wasn't um, tackling. And I knew it's a problem. It was a problem since I was like 15. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what it was, but I, it was like in the back of my mind, but I never said it to anyone or it wasn't really public information and I was like I need to really like confront this because this is the biggest fear of my life and I was always like putting it in the back of my mind um, and so I was like man I need to get ready to die again so I need to really because it's like you're confronting your biggest fear which usually is like correlated to death so you need to be ready to die so I remember getting an appointment at the doctor and going into uh, a hospital and just like sweating trembling not because of any particular thing that they were going to do but from confronting my fear that i was like hiding for 10 years from myself not from anybody else just from me i wasn't even thinking about it and at the end it was nothing it was just nothing that my fear was just all messed up it wasn't really any disease the disease i thought i have for 10 years and then this thing lee left after like two or three days and since mm. then i haven't felt it i'm like subhanallah so what, what is this? You know, like, um, and I know many people who have this problem actually around my age, oh, the, back then, 25. Like, um, it, it happens to a lot of young men and also young women. Um, and I don't know why, but it's sort of, 
I don't know, triggers something in you. And it's like this psychological thing. So if you're listening, there is a way out, but I just don't know what it is. But no one can help you, basically. You have I, to no, confront I think your you biggest do, fear. I think yeah. you do know what it is. It's, it's what you said. You confronted it. Yeah. But you, you it's, processed it. You dealt it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. dealt with it. And it's, but it's like, imagine you're big. Let's say you were raped as a child, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine confronting that fear. Like, can you imagine that? You were putting it in the back of your mind for so long and then you're confronting it. Like, it's so difficult as an adult to go back and it's like something along those lines so it's like you don't ever want to think about those things right and i don't know if it that because there wasn't a specific moment that triggered it it just sort of manifested just like out of nowhere uh, so i haven't felt it for five years and but at the end it got really painful my head it was like always uh. so yeah just crazy stuff i don't know um yeah so i know when i was um I was studying psychology that if you have trauma from your life that's just goes unresolved and you keep pushing it to the side pushing it to the side pushing it to the side trying to like run away from it what ends up happening is you start to develop mental dis-ease which then leads mm. to physical dis-ease so you may not have wrong you may not have anything wrong physically but physically you will begin to have issues because of what's going on mentally yeah for sure it's crazy bro but yeah. subhanallah it's it's kind of it, it sucks but it's kind of amazing at the same time that that allah does this to us you know he created the body and the mind in such a way where it's like it it, it takes care of itself you know what i mean like yeah bro if you have um if a guy does no fat semen retention they mm. don't release at all they don't have sex at all within a matter of time like the body is going to take care of itself and the body is going to release while you're sleeping i know <laughs> yeah yeah i think any dude who has done this knows and like that's that's the same with our mind and with our physical health where it's like yo if you're experiencing something like that your body is trying to tell you something and if you keep ignoring it, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. But the, that, bro. the good thing is like, it out. yeah, the good thing is like, what's worse than imagining you're dying? Probably nothing. I mean, there may be are different things that are worse, especially as a non-Muslim. Imagine you're a non-Muslim atheist and you're thinking about that. So it's obviously depressing because you don't have any, anything after that. Mm. Um, and so if you are in that state as an atheist, I was confronting that fear. I don't think there's anything more because I remember right after I came out of it, I was like, man, like if I can really like be okay with dying, then like, what's the problem with paying rent or like doing some work? Like, well, this is nothing. <laughs> like I just con confronted death <laughs> and it's okay. Mm -hmm. So it gives you this, like, I always, whenever something's hard, I was like, try to go back like hey man remember five years ago you confronted death like you were like okay i'm gonna die and you didn't so it's like it gives you this boost like uh, to always remember that i mean and then it always reminds you and that's why i also became muslim like this is actually gonna happen by the way you will die <laughs> so um but you have some time to prepare for it so hey, inshallah bro inshallah yeah. we have time to prepare for it yeah, or at least you can be in a better state because I'm definitely in a better state now than I was like five years ago, uh, if it were to happen. But um, yeah, it's just uh, crazy stuff like that. Uh, anyways, one thing I wanted to recommend as well is if you don't have anything to read, uh, get this book. It's called Islam Between East and West. Have you read this one? It's, this is gonna, this is, going to blow you your mind like five times more than Al-Ghazali. Uh, and it's written by a uh, president of Bosnia. It's like a European guy. And there's not, nothing about Islam, actually. It's nothing about Islam. Really? It's about the entire world. He starts off with the creation of the first cell or something and just compares art, politics. And then the last chapter is like Islam. But everything is, there's no Islam here. But it just gives you like a solution at the end but it compares the entire world from the beginning to the end. And it was written in 1980s. And this guy was a president of a country. 
Um, and so really get this one It's so deep, so deep, like, Every sentence, like, look how, mu how much. Uh, I yeah, have. yeah, yeah. I like, Send it, bro. This Send is it the over deepest the email with the other one. Yeah, you will clearly see like uh, the 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 wisdom of Islam, like it's it's showing, you know, in that book mm -hmm. uh, because it's written by a Westerner for Western people. It's like different. It's really good. Uh, yeah, bro, I got. I'll add it to the queue. I got so many books though, and like the yeah. first book you recommended me. The uh, unknowing yourself in God, the fact that now it, it, it was only the first chapter and I got this like two volume set. I got this like, one. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the one it's I got. It's the first I'll... chapter. It says, bro, yeah, 100%. Give me one Knowing second. yourself. No. This is it right here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So look at this, right? look at the um <laughs> it's such a short book by the way bro all this edition. short book but it, it literally took me like three months to actually digest it all because it was so there was so much to unpack but look yeah. the first part the first part is um on knowing yourself all right and then the second part is uh give me a second on knowing God, all right? Now, if I open this bad boy up... Is that like a, another edition of the same book? It's No, it's the book. Like, uh, okay. this That's right just here, first chapter. Okay. this one is like, I guess they just took it out yeah. so they could like, you know, give someone a little... You know how like, they have those YouTube videos that are like two hours, three hours on and they have like the, the short snippet of it, which yeah. is like 30 seconds a minute. This is what this is, bro. This is like a little snippet. And then when you realize that you got this beast, these two beasts of books, you're like, man, what did I just do? Have you read those or? Nah, bro. I literally got them a few days ago. Yeah. Look at this. Look at this. So That's crazy. The very first topic. I don't know if you can see it. It says yeah. knowing oneself. And the second one. Knowing God. Knowing yeah. God crazy so it is what it is man it is what it is i i do think they elaborate a little bit more in that tiny book that we have but um I, i'll let you know because i'm gonna read the the first chapter again so i can digest it some more yeah one other one once you read those and again al ghazali this one is a few days before he died he wrote this letters to a disciple and it's a student asking me like what would be your advice to somebody who's like starting life and he he's like there's just one one sentence i'll read you work for your terrestrial life in proportion to your location in it and work for your afterlife in proportion to your eternity in it and it's just full of it's so deep that it's like shooken me at some point so uh Damn, bro. it's really good so as just, well just send them bro I, i'll add them to the queue i got <laughs> yeah i, I have got so, so many, many as well I, dude i even got this other one here by um his name is uh william c she took let me see let me mm. see if i can get it real quick hold on a sec yeah sure it's uh maybe not many people will want to read this book but i feel like it's like there's a lot to unpack here so i want to read it uh but it's the sufi path of love and it's like the spiritual teachings mm. of rumi so it's about so, sufism and stuff i guess it's um it's definitely rumi was sufi and i think al ghazali was sufi too maybe well not, I don't know you know you know the secret every prophet was a sufi we just had a actually a lecture about sufism in a mosque uh and actually like the true sufism not the the ones where people dance and stuff but the real sufism which is about asceticism and just going uh, and just being with god alone which is being like super spiritual like every prophet had that aspect so every prophet was actually a sufi a spiritual leader but uh, they they took sufism and made so many parts of it you know yeah. uh, so yeah it's it's it, corrupted it gets now. questionable it gets questionable there are some crazy things some like some stuff. people some people actually take your your body and they 
put a put a knife in it or like a thing and they say like now god is now the devil has left your body like they they've uh there are some crazy sects in sufism as well who do this yeah, stuff yeah no thanks that's, that's they a took it far extra. far away yeah but the yeah, basic is extra. there are there's some some something to be learned but it again it comes from islam mm-hmm. so yeah all right bro send send me those through email though definitely definitely well thanks thanks for stopping by and chatting with me it was great as always and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to speak maybe in the future as well and yeah, man, inshallah. Uh, yeah inshallah it was great so thank you angel and everybody bro, next time go next watch time angel. we should uh my bad for cutting you off next time let's get the uh the other brothers as well like if we could get the uh the two that i do the podcast with and the t3m like here, have us all maybe. Four. Yeah, have us yeah, all if four we, on if one we have podcast. a specific theme, yeah, it could be good. Yeah, it could be good, inshallah. Inshallah, for sure. Well, thank you. And Inshallah. guys, go and check out Angel's channel if you're interested or Three Muslims podcast.